Welcome to Dayline Health. This is Fred Lipman coming to you from Nova Southeastern University. I just took off my mask. Uh, not getting into the politics of it. I'm just telling you that this is going to save your life, uh, help you save your lives. So wear your masks. Stay socially distant. I know how difficult it is. Believe me, we know here at Nova Southeastern, we have a whole student body that is adhering to the highest forms of social distancing, PPE, face masks, etc. So that's my homily for the day. Welcome to uh, Dayline Health. Uh, we have two wonderful uh, human beings who happen to be medical doctors as well. And uh, let me introduce to you Dr. Jose Luis Terrazas, uh, MD, uh, Royal Palm OBGYN. Welcome, Dr. Terrazas. Thank you for having me. Where's Royal Palm? We're in Coral Springs. Coral Springs, okay. Yes, sir. That's at the Northwest Medical Center, right? Yes, and I, uh, I practice out of Northwest Medical Center. And Dr. Daniel Gomez, MD, OBGYN at uh, Holy Cross Health, uh, one of the stalwarts in our community for, oh, decades upon decades. Welcome, Dr. Gomez. Thank you for having me on the show, and I appreciate the invitation. Thank you, sir. Uh, we are going to be talking about something which is uh, totally new, uh, not only to the, after today, it will be new, I think, to most of the public, but also new to a lot of colleagues that are out in the field there uh, working uh, in their practices and OBGYN and uh, general uh, health care venues. So let's talk about V-notes and minimally invasive surgery for OBGYNs. Dr. Jose Luis Terrazas, you are one of the honored few in the nation. Talk, talk to us. So V-NOTES stands for Vaginal Natural Orifice Transluminal Endoscopic Surgery. So long term to discuss vaginal surgery. So vaginal, for example, vaginal hysterectomy is the natural, is the original natural orifice surgery. However, traditionally OBGYNs, we performed it for years and years and years, and through the years it started falling out of favor. So notes is basically a surgical procedure where we do a vaginal hysterectomy, but with the assistance of laparoscopic instruments. So kind of marrying the traditional surgical technique of vaginal hysterectomy or vaginal surgical procedures and laparoscopy. And it's a surgical procedure that initially was being used uh, quite a bit in Europe and in China, and it's slowly starting to make its way across the Atlantic, and now it's starting to have a uh, big interest in, in the OBGYN community in the United States. I, I understand that uh, you are uh, one of few that have been trained uh, to the level on which it has uh, become part of the presentation uh, at, obviously, at Royal Palm, but at Northwest Medical Center. So uh, talk to us about the, the newness of this and also the, uh, the, the very specific advantage versus the traditional uh, utilization of a surgical technique uh, previous to this. Okay. So I had the pleasure, along with Dr. Gomez, to learn from learn this technique uh, from a surgeon in Belgium, Dr. John Bachlin, who he has been kind of one of the forefathers of the surgical technique. He's performed thousands of these uh, surgical techniques. And uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, that was February of 2019. We went up to Belgium to his hospital, saw multiple cases, and then we brought, we brought them back to, to our respective hospitals. And basically, vaginal hysterectomy is a minimally invasive surgical technique, for example, just to use as a technique. When you compare that to a laparoscopic hysterectomy, which is when we make small incisions in the abdomen to remove a uterus, whenever you do a, a minimally invasive technique, you improve your patient's outcome. There's less pain, faster recovery, faster back to baseline, back to work, back to your usual routine. And so the benefit of a 
of a V-node's hysterectomy, for example, will be, well, it's true or truly scarless surgery. There will be no abdominal incisions. Everything's done completely through the vagina. And sometimes you can do surgical techniques that you would not be doing on tra traditional vaginal hysterectomy. Because the traditional vaginal hysterectomy, you can't, uh, a lot of things you can't fully see. It's a lot, of, a lot by feel. And, and it's a technique that is, like I said, is falling out of favor. Not because it's not excellent, just because we're teaching it less in, in, in residency programs and having a lot of focus in other surgical techniques like the robotic-assisted laparoscopic surgery or traditional laparoscopy. So by being able to do these surgical procedures in a minimally invasive fashion, you can tackle a lot of pathology through the vagina that normally you would do another route. And you give the patient the opportunity for faster recovery, less pain, and no scars. Dr. Gomez, uh, as your colleague, uh, as being trained in, by the same, uh, I guess you could say, uh, pioneer uh, in this field of medicine in Belgium, uh, what are your thoughts? I think this goes on par with what we've been trying to do as gynecologic surgeons. Uh, Dr. Terraz and I go back a long time and we practice very similarly. Um, you know, our, our focus has been minimally invasive gynecologic surgery, uh, specializing in lapar uh, laparoscopy, robotics, and things of that nature, always because what you want to do is improve patient outcomes, right? That's the whole point of any new innovative procedure. How can we get patients home safely, faster, less pain, no incisions, or less incisions? And so when we were seeing how the continuum of laparoscopic care has evolved over the last couple of years, we're able to see how some of our colleagues in different parts of the world were utilizing a vaginal natural orifice endoscopic surgery in order to achieve even better outcomes than what we're doing, you know, before. So we were able to collaborate together um, and see how these techniques are being done. How can we safely apply it here and, um, you know, really, you know, give this as another option to our patients. This is another tool, by, uh, another tool in our surgical armamentarium that we have that we can offer our patients. And, you know, it's, it's, it's an exciting time because it is a new innovative procedure that um, very few are practicing now. But our goal is, is, is always to be able to educate not only just our patients, but also um, new gynecologic surgeons coming out that might benefit from this technique so that more people can benefit from it. We don't want to just say there's only two people that can do it. We want to be able to, you know, make this really um, kind of the standard of care for certain surgical interventions. You know, it's an interesting thing. Uh, the uh, in the twenty plus years that we've been doing Dateline Health, thanks to the viewers, uh, we get a lot of remarks from them, and uh, and we I, I always try to collate what are the three most important issues which relate which relate to their willingness to accept information, and the the, the number one issue is cancer. Uh, without any question. Number two is minimally invasive techniques. All of a sudden, it jumped above cardiac care. Uh, so those are the three. And the reason that people want to know about minimally invasive techniques, whether it's through V-notes or through prior involvement, it's because they know that minimally invasive techniques is less cutting, less blood, less pain. That's what I hear from the people out there. And you just, you just enumerated exactly what they are asking us to present to them. So uh, I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. Uh, the, the issue of, uh, of OBGYN in itself, uh, I, I don't want to take you away from your V-Notes specialization, uh, but... Uh, can we talk to the general public uh, about this? I'm going to ask you both to go a bit back to the, the primary issues of why the female population that is viewing us needs to visit an OBGYN on what basis, number one, and number two is what should they be thinking about? You know, on a very important topic because when, when especially when I, when I speak to the medical students that rotate with us, I always say, you know, you know, what we do is of utmost importance. Women's health care is um, something that in, in our community um, it is of utmost importance, yet is one of the only specialties 
that seems to gain an interest in sometimes negative aspects during a political year um, with their different cultural influences, et cetera. And so it's very important that we understand that women's health care is very underserved. It's important that we continue to innovate either in the outpatient setting and surgical setting in order to deliver the best possible care to, to, to women. Um, and, and it all starts in the outpatient setting, right? To be able to establish that relationship with the patient, the patient's family, to be able to gain their trust and see why do you need to see a gynecologist, a women's healthcare specialist on a yearly basis? How do the screening guidelines change for cervical cancer screening for mammograms? Um, we always have to be up to date with our education and our technologies in order to offer the best possible care according to the guidelines that are, that are put forth. And then in the event that somebody needs surgical intervention, we're not saying that everybody needs surgery. Um, but the very few patients that do meet that criteria um, where the surgical intervention we're going to provide is going to change their quality of life, then we're able to offer cutting edge, you know, novel techniques such as Venos. Dr. Tarasas, you want to add to that? I agree. I think uh, it's, it's extremely important to see the gynecologist, if you will, yearly because we sometimes talk about things that a lot of other physicians don't talk about. And we also talk a lot about problems that I wouldn't call them necessarily taboo, but it's topics that many women are not going to feel comfortable speaking about to their friends. For example, urinary incontinence, issues with uh, sexual health. And these are extremely important aspects that, you know, it's routine discussion for me to see a patient and say, so how are you feeling? Is your bladder doing okay? Is your bowel, are your bowels functioning well? Any issues with your, you know, sexual health? And so you'd be surprised how many times it comes up that the patient never actually told me this at the beginning or my medical assistant in the beginning that there was a problem. They just said, no, I'm here for my routine visit. And then when I ask them specifically those, those issues, it opens up uh, multiple complaints that need to get addressed. Because, again, it's all about improving quality of care for the patient and like I said, it's something very unique to the discipline. A lot of physicians don't ask specifically these problems that are very prevalent in, in the patient population. It must be a very large problem that is not necessarily available for the general public to talk about because these are maybe even within a family, they're taboo issues. Am I correct, Dr. Tarasas? Absolutely. It's actually... Um, not that frequent that women will talk about issues like urinary incontinence because you know it can be embarrassing that when they cough, laugh, sneeze, go to the gym, do any form of exercise, they lose urine or they're not able to make it to the bathroom on time or there's um, issues that they get up to go at night 10 times and they don't really sleep that well. So these are issues that a lot, in, at least in my experience and in my patient population, if I don't ask, they most likely will not let me know that that's a problem that's occurring. Dr. Gomez, I'm sure that you have uh, either a ditto or something else to add. I echo that sentiment because um, I, I heard this once from one of my patients that um, incontinence is not just something that develops later on in life. It could happen after childbirth. And a patient of mine once said, well, um, a family member of mine told me that's a normal part of being a mother. And, and sometimes, it, you know, it, when you think about it, a lot of it is the rates of urinary incontinence after childbirth, after surgery, um, uh, in the perimenopausal years, or menopausal years, it, it's underreported. And it, it's not something that should just be accepted as a normal part of life. This is something that we can assess, talk about, address, and there are interventions, surgical or non-surgical. Medication or no medication, physical therapy, public floor physical therapy um, is one of the most important tools that we have that's not as invasive for our patients in order to eliminate these symptoms so that they don't feel it's a normal part of whatever stage in life they are in. Does uh, the V-notes uh, involved, uh, is there a correlation between the, the utilization of this technique and uh, the uh, problems that are inherent with uh, certain cancer problems within the uh, reproductive uh, vaginal area? We, we have not seen, uh, um, with regards to see if I understand the question right, is there an increased risk of malignancy or cancer complications when using this uh, surgical technique? Is, that is do, you, do, you, do people come to you and then you, you find that there are problems? I mean, yes, you might find uh, a patient that is uh, properly, uh, scheduled to do uh, mammograms and uh, pap smears or whatever, 
and to see their OBGYN at least once a year, I would assume. Uh, uh, I mean, is there any involvement? Do you see anything in your in your work uh, doing V notes, which which shows uh, some uh, potential for averting cervical cancer or things of that nature? We do a lot of what's called preoperative testing, and there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes prior to the patient presenting to the operating room. Their pap smear needs to be up to date. Uh, possible biopsies of the endometrium and somebody who meets criteria, physical examination, preoperative risk stratification, in order to catch um, certain issues that might come up and complicate a surgery. So by the time the patient is taken to the operating room, we've already addressed so many different things that could potentially come up in in somebody's healthcare, so that you don't see any surprise or any you know, especially where you're alluding to any uh, surprises and malignancy or things of that nature during the during the case. Dr. Tarasis? I agree. I think uh, preoperative uh, evaluation and risk stratification is key for those of us um, who are benign gynecologists. Uh, in my world, um, in our world, in the world of gynecology, it's a well-established fact that uh, malignancy, gynecologic malignancy, will be best treated by gynecologic oncologists. So for me, standard of care, making sure that everything has been screened appropriately, cervix, endometrium, and we're going to do a hysterectomy because if there is a fact of a malignancy, um, you know, there are many gynecologic oncologists in the area and my patients can have access to them and their outcome will be best, uh, best if they receive that surgical intervention from them. And there are gynecologists in the country doing V-notes for endometrial malignancies, actually. Uh, one of the docs over at... Uh, uh, in Arkansas, in Little Rock, he's doing uh, endometrial cancers with uh, via V notes. Uh, I was just going to ask you. I, I apologize. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Uh, I, what I was going to ask you is: do you, Did you have knowledge of of this being utilized in uh, other surgical re, for other surgical reasons? And you just gave the answer. Uh, l- let me just uh, talk to you a moment about both of you. Uh, about the the issues re- relating to uh, the fact that we have uh, probably the highest number percentage wise of people over the age of seventy in Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach County. Do you see any late year situations where your techniques would be involved? Yeah, definitely. In certain instances, again, the application of V-notes is for a number of different conditions. Um, Why is hysterectomy one of the most commonly performed procedures? Uterine fibroids, postmenopausal bleeding, pre-malignant or malignant conditions, pelvic pain, endometriosis, just to name a few. And so there are conditions that can affect women in different stages of life, even in the latter stages of somebody's life, like postmenopausal bleeding, pre-malignant conditions, patients who have been on certain um, like bioidentical hormones or for a long period of time or things of that nature that might affect their endometrium um, and the uh, and the health of the uterus or ovarian issues such, you know, patients who have ovarian cysts or family history of uterine cancer, ovarian cancer, things of, uh, uh, of that nature. And so the V-notes, what, what we enjoy about it is the fact that it's it's applicable to so many different things. And especially our elderly patients or patients who've already gone into menopause and latter stages um, they benefit from uh, the least invasive surgical application possible, right? How do we decrease rates of complication, less blood loss, less pain, less incisions in order to expedite the recovery so that we don't put too much strain on their, strain on their heart, so we don't put too much strain on their nervous system and things of that nature. And so this is why this technique is, a, you know, it's, we, we believe in it, we continue to develop it with the uh, appropriate data and uh, gathering our outcomes to make sure that we are delivering the best possible care. You know, uh, with uh, members of your medical community uh, that, and, and experts that uh, appear on our show over the years, and particularly uh, at recent times, because I believe, and you probably can observe this, uh, over the last decade plus, uh, the whole area of presentation of uh, what I would call esoteric or the highest level of healthcare, not to, not to demean or denigrate any of the wonderful founding fathers and mothers of, of our healthcare systems in South Florida. But, you know, 
there are more people now that are, that are seeking care rather than running to Chicago or to New York or to Texas or to California or whatever. Here they're beginning to see the, the collaborative nature, the, the, the trained nature of our health professionals and our hospital systems that are providing the highest level of care. Do you see that, Dr. Tarazos? Absolutely. I think, uh, I think it's extremely important, especially like Dr. Gomez was saying, in the world of OBGYN, it, it, it's a profession that overall is underserved. And I think it's very important that we can provide our patients locally here with the most up-to-date, evidence-based care to improve their outcomes. So, and, and, and another thing that kind of goes in segue of this, it's not all about corrective medicine. It's preventative medicine. There's a lot of preventative medicine that takes place in, in the world of, of centers of gynecology that is extremely important because it, we can prevent a lot of situations that require surgical intervention, that require invasive procedures just by routine visits to, to any doctor, whether be male, female, uh, patients, just routine screening. And for obviously females, gynecologic care is extremely important. Um, but I do believe that locally, there is good access to up-to-date care. And I think uh, the more that uh, we all collaborate and to improve the patient's outcomes, so there, there will be, hopefully, no need to be going anywhere else to receive care. No, 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 no traveling to New York, Chicago, or, or Texas, like you were saying, and just down the street from your house, be able to get good care. Well, and I also see, uh, and you both work in institutions where there's been a, a, a regeneration of the the the, uh, the facilities themselves. I mean, the the multi uh, practice, multi uh, the collaborative ORs, for example, the the ability to communicate um, uh, during the surgical procedures with other physicians that could be very helpful uh, or you're seeking information that uh, doesn't just come out of your head. It's, it's, it's there. Uh, and uh, a lot of the units that work as teams in these uh, so-called, uh, no, I don't want to say so-called, they are great uh, healthcare centers around the nation. But we, we are now the repository in Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach County, particularly uh, of the highest level of healthcare that could be afforded to patients. Am I correct? That's correct. Um, and, and, and as a patient, when you look at it from their perspective, you say, all right, I have this condition. Who can provide me the best quality care? You know, and, and it, it can be hard to really identify, you know, who has the specialized training, not just the name, but also the outcomes, who performs the procedures the most. Just to add on Dr. Terrell's point, it is important for our patients to know what their resources are to know that the surgeon that they're going to or the physician that they're going to performs a certain amount of cases that's held to certain standards, it's board certified as a fellow of their college, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, what, what I like is that, for example, Dr. Taraz and I are in two separate institutions, but we, we collaborate a lot. Why? Because we believe that in the power of collaboration, multi-specialty groups, uh, multidisciplinary applications to, to patient care improves patient outcomes. And so what we're trying to do in gynecologic surgery, as well as our colleagues around the country, is that we want to be able to, uh, you know, let our patients know what the resources are within their communities, uh, who are the, the, uh, the surgeons that are performing with the highest quality care, the highest, uh, the best possible outcomes in order to be able to get these patients to these docs in order to, you know, provide the best quality outcomes. And so, you know, um, it's, it's something that we have locally. These are resources here, but I can guarantee you that we collaborate across the country with various specialists that are not only using B-notes, but other minimally invasive um, applications. Well, we're down to the last couple of minutes of the show, and I, I really, uh, I, I know this is sort of a, a technical uh, point of reference in healthcare, but I, I'm really thankful that we are blessed with people that are so highly skilled and highly trained, like both of you, Dr. Ho Jose Luis Terrasas at uh, Northwest Medical Center at Royal Palm, uh, and Dr. Daniel Gomez, uh, uh, they're both OBGYNs, and uh, Dr. Gomez is at Holy Cross Health. Uh, I want to thank you both, not only for what knowledge you have, 
but for the method in which you uh, present that knowledge. Uh, it takes uh, humility, it takes kindness. Uh, you're in a field where uh, you talk to individuals at almost to their inner soul. Uh, and I want to thank you both for your advocacy and for your knowledge. So thank you very much for being here today. Uh, I always tell the people, in case they're wondering why both of you are not wearing masks, is because you're not in the studio. We're doing this by Zoom. And uh, uh, all, of my, all the people that are behind the cameras here are wearing masks. And uh, this place has been sanitized so that I'm safe. And I got my mask. Uh, and I'm just asking you to uh, take good care of yourself. Remember, uh, I, I always tell you, try to take good care of yourself. And in this case, uh, with the, having the OBGONs here, the female community, make sure that you get your annual checkups and whatever follow-up checkups are prescribed by your uh, health professional. One more time, my name is Fred Lippman. Uh, we come to you from Nova Southeastern University. If you have any questions or you want some answers, there's a telephone number and your, an address right here. And don't forget your mask. It's not an issue of anything more than protecting you, your family, and others. Love yourself, love them. Wear your mask. Again, my name is Fred Lippman. I come to you from Nova Southeastern University. Until next time, see you.